Thank you, Bill, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, many of you have seen this video. Uh, the institute where I'm working at belongs to the Leibniz Association, and last year was Leibniz year, and uh, I happen to be the only uh, female, young, energetic virologist that had time to go to Berlin, so that's why I'm in that video. And I think it nicely illustrates what uh, we're all interested in this little guy, a virus, and it also shows you that viruses can naturally fly, at least some of them, when you blow them in somebody else's face. Um, and this is important if you want to study them with mass spectrometry. The main technique we're using is native mass spectrometry. So just a little bit uh, for you to understand what we're doing. Normally, when you run the mass spectrum, you would have your viral protein. In this case, it's a capsid protein of norovirus, VP1. You would have it in organic solvent with a little bit of formic acid. So your nice structure will unfold. And since you have a large surface, it will take up a lot of charges. And what you see then in your mass spectrum is along the mass to charge uh, ratio, you see a lot of different peaks, each of the peak having uh, different charge. Here you have the lower charge states, here the higher ones, and from the adjacent peaks we can determine the mass. This is very nice for accurate mass measurements, but it doesn't tell you anything of the, uh, about the complexes you have. If we take the very same protein and put it into buffered solution, which has to be volatile so we can get rid of the salts in the mass spectrometer, then we see that we get a very different mass spectrum. The mass to charge ratio is now an order of magnitude higher, and we're looking at the intact virus-like particles, which are, in this case, T3 particles. Since we here had two species, um, we couldn't get um, charge state resolution for the intact capsids, but this is just to show you that it's possible for the hepatitis B capsids, back then I was able to get mass resolution and uh, resolve the two species. Um, what kind of information can you get from native MS? First of all, of course, since you measured the mass, you can get information about stoichiometry. You can confirm that when you do uh, in solution or gas phase dissociation. That can also tell you something about the topology in your complex, where a subunit is located. And using eye mobility experiments, we can also say something about the gross shape and look at large conformational changes. And we can do that in a more or less quantitative fashion because the signal intensities usually reflect pretty well the concentrations in solution. That comes in handy if you want to study other processes, for example, uh, ligand binding. That's one of the things I will talk about today. So you can determine the ratio of the unbound protein to the ligand bound protein and determine uh, KDs and such. You can also study uh, the mass of your complex in a time resolved fashion to look at, for example, protein complex assembly. And uh, this is just a little video to illustrate how the instrumentation works. We're coming from here with the electrospray. Then very often we have a quadrupole mass analyzer where we can select out a single species. Then we can activate it by collision with gas molecules. And what then happens is the subunit unfolds and leaves the complex. Um, which is a nice thing because now we have two species here. This is a nine mobility cell, and um, I think Brian will go more into detail about eye mobility. But what happens here is you have a counter gas flow to your ions. So bigger ions experience more friction than smaller ions. It's basically like when you're cycling against the wind. If you're compact, you will be fast. If you do this, you may not move at all. And that's what we measure then. And um, in the end, the main mass analyzer is the time of flight, uh, which gives us very high mass resolution. And uh, the system uh, we're working on a lot these days um, is noroviruses. You've all had it, and it's not very pleasant, as you all know. Um, it's uh, the main cause of viral gastroenteritis. And depending on the literature, it's about 1 to 20 particles that's sufficient. Uh, you find it in seafood. Oysters are very popular. Uh, 
co uh, source of noroviruses. It's single-stranded RNA, it's non-enveloped, uh, which means the capsid protein forming this T3 capsids has to carry out all the function from cell attachment uh, to um, uncoating, protection of the genome, and so on. Um, the capsid protein is fairly large, with a bit more than 50 kilodalton. It comes uh, in a shell domain, which is on its own able to form the capsid, and it has a protruding domain, which is responsible for the cell attachment and reinforcement of the capsid. And if you just take this P domain, you can study binding uh, to the natural ligands, which are glycans on the cell surface. And for human viruses, fucose is the minimum attachment factor, which is found in histone blood group antigens. And um, until very recently, it was thought that each monomer had a single binding site, so you would get two binding sites per dimer. And that's what we started out with, and we thought this is a nice system to set up our methods and then go to other viruses. That's not quite what happened, because it turned out to be more interesting. So the first bit we will look at is the cell attachment of the norovirus. Um, this is my very reductionist view of viral life cycle in bacteria and for an envelope viruses, uh, virus, which we don't have here, but um, never mind. Um, and this is just to remind you, this is the environment that the norovirus is facing. This is an endothelial, uh, um, endothelial uh, in a blood vessel. Um, Fair enough, noroviruses cause most of the problems uh, in the gastrointestinal tract, but they can infect almost any cell in your body, and uh, it doesn't look that much different in the gastrointestinal tract. These hairs you can see here, that's all glycans. So the cell surface is entirely covered with that, with very high concentrations here, and somehow the virus has to get through that. So how do we look at um, glycan binding with a mass spectrometer? First of all, we, of course, have to look at um, how our P-dimer looks. And uh, we also have a reference protein, cytochrome C, here. And when we then put in our histoblood group antigen B, uh, we get such a spectrum, so it's pretty messy. You see uh, a lot of uh, glycans sitting on the P-domain, but you also see that the cytochrome C, which is not supposed to bind this B antigen, takes a lot of glycans along. And the reason for this is the electrospray process. We have droplets of a certain size, um, and there is a chance that some free glycans are in that very same droplet and just dry down onto our protein. That's why we have the reference protein to, cor um, to correct for that. But you can see that here we have a nice ladder, and here we have much more on the P-dimer. So there is specific binding underneath this uh, unspecific clustering. So we can correct for that, and what we then get are these nice bar graphs where we see uh, just the specific binding. And what you can see here is uh, that we have up to four B antigens bound to a dimer instead of two that were anticipated originally. And this is not an artifact of our measurements. Um, this is a study we did on, on a Saga P dimer, and our colleagues used the very same strain and did saturation transfer NMR, um, where you can measure how much glycan you've bound. And what they see if they titrate in the B saccharide, they see four discrete steps. It's not necessarily the binding pockets, but it's intriguing that they see four steps when we see four binding events. And here's just a zoom in. And um, collaborators from Heidelberg did a crystal structure with a different strain, though, and just Foucault's, but they see four Foucault's uh, molecules in the binding cleft, so there's pretty good indications that there are indeed four instead of two binding sites. We also uh, went uh, to another strain, MI001, which belongs uh, to the same genome group uh, like the one we've looked at before, uh, which usually infect humans, which means they bind to Foucault's. But this one can also infect mice. Um, and usually, if you have murine noroviruses, they bind sialic acid. So if this one can infect both, the question is obvious, can bind both. 
So we first looked whether it retained the binding to Foucault's and we tied it in the B-saccharide and indeed uh, we see it can bind and we also see the four binding sites again. Um, most of the times um, I will only show you single point uh, measurements but we do these titrations to get better estimates of the KD. So if we then take uh, sialic acid containing glycan like GM3, we see um, that we do get binding um, and we tested at two different ionic strengths. Initially we had started with high ionic strengths but it turns out uh, that lower ionic strengths is, uh, is better so we have to put in less glycan, we get less uh, clustering so it's easier to analyze the data. Um, we used the A antigen which is just different uh, in uh, in, in this moiety, I think, from the B, and we see again binding, and for uh, the B, we see binding, but a lot more than for GM3 and A. Um, we don't see the four binding sites with GM3 and A that could easily mean that affinity is just lower, as is evident from the amount of binding we see, but it could also be that the additional binding sites are not opening up, that something is not happening with these two. Um, so just to summarize that again, GM3 and A behave similar and uh, B has a much higher affinity and definitely has these additional binding sites. So, if we just look at individual sugars, which we can't do in mass spectrometry, but SCD and MR can do that. Single galactose that you can see here, this is the reference spectrum, this is the different spectrum uh, of sample with and without protein. You see no signals, which means no binding. Single galactose cannot bind, as well as single sialic acids can't bind. Focus can. So um, we thought, okay, let's just go to a larger galactose sugar so we have a proper negative control. So we went to this GB4 antigen, which contains of uh, an acetyl galactosamine, galactoses, and the glucose, and shouldn't bind. Surprisingly enough, it has a very similar KD for the first binding event as has the B antigen, around 100 <coughs> micromolar. So this is obviously not a negative control, and we have tested other things. It seems like almost anything that has at least three sugars in a row or branched, uh, like the B, can bind. So then the question, of course, arises, um, are all these binders functional? That, that can't be. There must be some specific, uh, specificity to decide what cell to enter and to, uh, to have the species tropism. Um, so when we take a close, closer look at the B antigen binding, so this is uh, now again for each charge state separate before I had the sum charge state. What you can see is that for the two strains we've looked at so far, we see very little binding for the low charge states and much more for the high charge states. And for this one, it's even more evident. Um, what is so interesting about that? Well, the higher the charge state, usually the higher the surface, if you remember from the beginning the denatured protein, which took up a lot of charges. So this could be an indication that there is a preference for a slightly more open structure for the B antigen to bind. Um, so this could be an indication for a structural change that is ongoing and uh, that would hopefully not be observed for these uh, binders that are not supposed to have an effect. And we're now uh, testing that with negative effectors, um, which are human milk oligosaccharides. And I can tell you already that if you plot this nicely, you, you get a certain trend for the B antigen, but the GB4, which we hope to have as a negative control gives a flat line. We don't know whether the milk oligosaccharides do the opposite thing yet. That would be nice, of course. Okay, so much about binding. Uh, let's go to capsid assembly and disassembly, because ultimately we want to look at uh, the glycan binding on the VLPs, which means we have to characterize them first. So um, back then, when I was still doing my PhD in Utrecht, 
we did already a study on the Norwalk virus capsid, and uh, we received from a different lab a prep, and we tried to reproduce our old data here. And um, well, it looks similar. We get a t equals three, but the prep is not as nice as the one we had back then. So we also have a bit of t equals one in there, and it's known that norovirus can form both sizes. Um, Maybe the preparation here um, has one purification step less. We don't know. Maybe there is a mutation. Uh, if you ask the collaborators, they always say, we do it the very same way. Um, we also received different strains, and we had to look how they look at uh, neutral pH. And um, this is a G217 Kawasaki, a very recent strain, which caused an epidemic in uh, in Japan, and also here we t see T3 and uh, T1, and you can also see in the EM uh, some smaller particles here, but most of them are T3. Um, then there's another Japanese strain, <coughs> which didn't cause epidemics, but is relatively new, and what we see is just a little bit of T3, some malformed particles, and T equals 1, and that's also evident in the EM, where you have lots of small particles. So then um, what we wanted to look at is how stable are these particles as we change the conditions. Um, in Norwalk virus, it was the following. If we went to alkaline pH but kept high ionic strengths, we would shift the equilibrium to T equals 1, um, some weird A-teamer and lots of smaller intermediates. At low ionic strengths but high pH, we abolished assembly, and if we put this back into neutral pH, high ionic strengths, we would recover the T equals 3. With our new prep, um, it again looks slightly different. Um, we do lose the T equals 3 signal at high ionic strengths, high pH. Hmm? No, it's not from patients. It's VLPs, virus-like particles. So it's, um, they are produced in insect cells. No patient samples. I would have six students all the time. Yeah, highly contagious. No way we would work on the real thing. Um, so, <laughs> no genome. Um, sorry that I didn't make that clear. Um, but yeah, we do see some intermediates. Um, unfortunately, if we uh, go to the ionic strength, some of the TC is very, uh, T equals one is very persistent, doesn't want to go away but we do see less of these other species. And if we go back from this condition uh, to neutral pH, we do regain some of the T equals 3. At least uh, qualitatively, it's similar. Not quite happy yet, uh, but at least it, it disassembles and it reforms. If we now go to the Kawasaki strain and test different pH, um, what we see is that the T3 doesn't care and neither does the T1, not a lot is happening. There seems to be a lot, some smaller species here which actually do disassemble, so this is the VP1 dimer, this big peak here. And we also did EM to confirm that the particles are stable and you can see uh, more or less nice T equals 3 in each of the graphs. So nothing is happening to those. Um, not quite what we expected, but there seems to be uh, quite a difference from strain to strain. But what we will now do on this one is we will add glycans and see whether um, our E factors that, are, that we think induce structural change actually help us disassemble these guys under multi alkaline conditions, probably pH 8, where we still know that the glycans can bind. Um, this would be a proof that there is indeed something happening. Uh, with this, I want to switch gears. And um, I've shown you that just uh, two minutes ago or so. Um, back then in Utrecht, uh, we looked at all these intermediates with eye mobility to get some information about their structure and come up with an assembly model. Uh, which was very nice, but our resolution was very low. What we would like to see is really this at atomic resolution. But of course, these intermediates can't be purified, and uh, that's what drove me to the European XFEL, and uh, I will bother you now again with my idea what I want to do there. Um, 
So the European XFVL um, is an X-ray free electron laser, currently um, under construction in the Hamburg area. We start out uh, at the DESI synchrotron, um, which some of you might know, um, with the electron gun, and then we run 3.4 kilometers to the next federal state where we have the experimental hall. You can see the experimental do hall down here. Uh, this is the main building, um, and underneath the main building is the experimental hall. It's nearing completion. We had first light uh, in the experimental hall, and first user experiments are starting in September. And the single particle uh, consortium that I'm part of will have uh, beam time in November, and we're all very excited. So um, stay tuned. Um, we have user labs, so you can prepare your biological samples or also uh, other samples um, on campus, there are six instruments for biology, for meteorology, material science, uh, femtosecond chemistry, and so on. Um, so the, the XFVL uh, delivers femtosecond long X-ray pulses of very high uh, intensity. The peak brilliance is about a billion times higher than a third generation synchrotrons, so we're dealing with a lot more photon flux um, in a shorter time. It's mostly coherent radiation, that's why we call it a laser, and um, I have a little video on the next slide to uh, explain a little bit why it is coherent, and for Bogdan, because he was uh, mentioning anisotropic uh, radiation the other day. Um, since it's um, a superconducting linear accelerator, we can run at high pulse rates, so in total we will get 27,000 pulses per second coming in this weird time structure, so um, we have a 10 hertz pulse rate and then uh, within 600 microseconds we have 2,700 pulses in a row. Um, and with this repetition rate and the peak brilliance, it's superior to other free electron lasers that are available around the world. Um, for hard X-rays, which you need for structural studies, that's LCLS in Stanford and SACLA in Japan. And there are also soft X-ray lasers available. Um, the first two were flash, which is conveniently also in Hamburg and works with the very same time structure. And uh, Fermi in Italy, there's one now uh, also in Switzerland nearing completion, and there's another hard X-ray, FEL, in Korea, um, almost ready. So uh, this is a video that illustrates how the light is produced. This is our electron packet, which is wiggling uh, close to the speed of light along a magnetic structure called undulator. Um, and now we see a zoom in into our electron cloud. And uh, if you send uh, charged particles at the speed of light um, along curved paths, they don't very much like that they start to emit light, and I guess most of you uh, being physicists understand that much better than I do. Um, but since they travel uh, for a certain distance aside each other, they do interfere, so we get a microstructure here uh, in the electrons, um, which leads them to, uh, to be in the same phase, basically. And then uh, a certain phase within the light is amplified, and you get this spontaneous self-amplified emission and very bright light. <clears throat> and that's also one of the reasons why we need this long structure, because they have to pa uh, travel in parallel for a long time to really get these bright pulses. So um, why would you like to do biology or look at structure uh, at a free electron laser? Why not go to a synchrotron? So most um, high-resolution structures usually come from X-ray crystallography, where you have your proteins nicely in order to amplify your signal um, from the repetitive structure. But uh, in my view, proteins are more like this. They all take up different conformations, and they don't like to be packed in crystals. And that especially holds for my viral intermediates. So in order to image those, you need very high intensities like we have at the free electron laser. But unfortunately, 
your particle will explode and the plasma is not very informative of your original protein structure. That's where the short femtosecond pulses come in handy. They will have scattered at the particle and left the particle before the explosion actually can take place and our diffraction pattern still comes from the original particle structure. But of course you can't re-image that plasma cloud so you have to send in more particles, take a lot of diffraction patterns very much like in cryo-EM, classify, then do 3D averaging and eventually reconstruct. Um, since it's possible to do single particles. It's obvious that everything that can't be crystallized is of interest. So um, my, my former postdoc supervisor is mostly interested in non-reproducible stuff like intact cells. Um, you can also look at membrane complexes, but also dynamic systems, disordered proteins, and most importantly, transient species. But this um, poses another problem. They only make up a subfraction of your data set, so it's very difficult to find them and means you have to acquire a lot of, of data, which takes a lot of time. So it would be nice if you somehow could filter them out, which brings us to the point how we get sample in. The most popular way uh, are liquids, liquid jets, like the ones uh, you can see here. Um, and they provide atomic resolution from uh, small crystals. Uh, this is one of the first examples um, published in 2013 um, on a protein from trypanosoma, so that's uh, sleeping disease. So it's very nice for the serial crystallography stuff, but single particles you can only image in the water window because you have a lot of water around in the liquid jet, uh, which creates background. And this is a 10 nanometer protein, roughly the size of RNA uh, polymerase, so it's not a small complex, but there's obviously a lot more water. So the only way you can look at that is if you go to the water window and that limits your resolution to something like four nanometers. And uh, here's an example from bacteriophage P22, um, and the resolution doesn't go very high out. So you have to go to the gas phase somehow. There, aerosol injectors are used, which look a bit like a gun and uh, it's kind of similar. But also there you have a high background for small particles because the initial droplets you create are 100 times larger in volume than your 10 nanometer object. Plus you have a high co uh, particle consumption and they are very difficult to pulse. So you lose material while you have no beam. And all the sorting has to be done online, so we still face a problem that the analysis time is much, much longer than the acquisition time. Um, but nevertheless, it works nicely for large things like mimiviruses, half a micron across, or carboxysomes. So uh, in my view, the ideal sample delivery system has a low sample consumption, um, so time particle release. We should work from a natural environment, but as I pointed out, no background is very important, so we have to forget about the natural environment, rather have a diffraction pattern and no natural environment. And we would like to select a species from a mixture, do some pre-sorting and speed up the data analysis. And this brings us back to native mass spectrometry where we can do all this. We have the nano electrospray source up front, which uh, gives us low background or controllable background, I should say, and a low sample consumption. This, of course, uh, comes with a drawback. We have little particles to hit, um, but since we're dealing with ions, uh, we can trap them and time the particle release with the free electron lasers and make up for the low ion density. Then uh, we have the quadrupole I showed you before where we can single out the species that we want to look at and thereby purify low abundance species. We can go one step further <clears throat> and behind the quadrupole uh, introduce eye mobility separation to pick out certain conformations. And uh, here's an old example where we um, first selected was a quadrupole, a single species, and this is just a fragmentation experiment to prove that it is what it is. And on a neighboring peak, we separated two species with eye mobility, so this is perfectly possible. Yeah, Robert. 
um, they do have slightly elevated temperature because they still experience gas collisions and take up energy, but it's not straightforward to calculate what you have. What you can see is if you activate too much, your profiles change and your proteins unfold. And if you activate too little, your water will be stuck to it. So we have an indirect readout. Um, I, didn't, I never dared to calculate it because it's really complicated. Um, but you could also additionally cool or heat if you wish to. And uh, <clears throat> we will also attempt to uh, align the molecules according to their dipole. Uh, this would again be helpful for the data analysis, but I won't go into detail because um, it's a challenge on its own. Um, and we will keep the time of flight for online diagnostics so we know all the system is working. We won't see the particles that we have imaged, but those that we missed. And we have pretty well defined now how uh, this region should look with the trap and all the mass and conformation filters. We've determined the ion flux and it's much higher than we originally expected. So uh, we should get a decent uh, hit rate with the laser and we performed the first experiments at FLASH. Um, here you can see our setup. So this is basically a commercial mass spectrometer into which we drilled a hole to connect it to the vacuum system of the beam line. At FLASH, we were not interested in structure because we have soft x-rays. We can't get to a meaningful resolution, but we have a very similar pile structure so we can test a lot of things. And the idea was that we would get multi-photon absorption, and depending on the intensity, we would go from plasma to peptide or uh, single protein ejection subcomplex formation. So that's very interesting on its own uh, for proteomics applications. And um, this is the kind of data we got. Without flash, we got a normal mass spectrum, and with flash, we got a new, lot of new peaks, um, which are hopefully peptides. Uh, my postdoc had to do other things, but he's now back on this data trying to assign the masses. Uh, resolution was not as good as we were hoping, but next time. Yeah, I'm almost done. That's perfect. <laughs> so with this, I'd like to sum up. Um, so uh, I hope I've convinced you that mass spectrometry is a versatile tool to study viruses. Um, for example, strain-specific dynamics and assembly, but also ligand binding, and that in the future you want to run all your samples where you're interested in structure uh, at the XFLMS system. We call it Visa V. Uh, that's the name of uh, of the funding. Uh, last year we finally got some funds, and now we're taking taking up uh, momentum, and uh, finally progress is happening. Uh, with this, I'd like to thank uh, my group, uh, especially Ellen, who's working on the XFAL project, How, um, Julia, where's Ronja, um, who work on the norovirus, and the microscopy platform, um, who are responsible for the EM data. Um, the collaborators uh, that provide sample and additional data, the colleagues at XFAL, and a few companies that helped me with designing the instruments and of course, all the funding sources. And you for your attention, I'm happy to take any further questions.